The Night Beat starts right now. A Texas woman on death row for the death of her daughter. Why people locally and around the nation are pushing for her not to be killed. A man found tied up, stabbed and left for dead. The details on how he was discovered. And San Antonio music scene suffering a loss tonight where this heavy metal music icon was found dead. But first on the night B, we now have the identification of the man found on the side of the road, tied up, severely stabbed and left to die. His name is Joshua Sandoval. Tonight, the Bear County Sheriff's Office also releasing his photo and more details about his condition tonight. He has been identified as 24 years old and a New Braunfels resident. The man was discovered by a person driving around 7 o'clock this morning on Lavernia Road in far east Bear County near Highway 87. Sheriff Javier Salazar says the man had severe stab wounds to the face and upper body. They were able to get some information from him before taking him to the hospital in critical condition. If you're stabbing somebody in the upper body and head, you're trying to kill them at that point. There's there's no trying to send a message. There's no trying to scare anybody. You're you're trying to murder somebody in cold blood and then leave them out here on the road to die uh, tied up and alone. I mean, there's just no more cold blooded crime than that. As of now, there are still no arrests in this case. Anyone with information is asked to call the BCSO gang unit. The number on your screen, 210-335-GANG. In other news, a woman on death row is receiving a huge show of support just four days before her scheduled execution. Melissa Lucio is set to be put to death on Wednesday in Cameron County. That's near Harlingen. She was convicted of killing her two year old daughter at their home in Harlingen back in 2007. Rally organizers tell the night teams Lee Waldman they are hoping Governor Greg Abbott grants a stay of execution because they believe she's innocent. St. Mary's University Law School student Cody Huffman is one of the organizers hoping to garner support for death row inmate Melissa Lucio. Melissa was um, interrogated for almost seven hours, just minutes after being taken in after her daughter's death. Back in 2007, Lucio's two-year-old daughter Mariah did not wake up from her nap. Police believe the child died from abuse. Lucio claims she fell downstairs two days prior. According to the Innocence Project, a criminal justice reform nonprofit that hopes to exonerate wrongly convicted people, the mother of 14 said over 100 times she had not killed her daughter, Mariah, throughout the course of questioning only saying at the end, quote, I guess I did it, unquote. That same year, prosecutors argued the child's injuries were consistent with abuse and a jury found Lucio guilty of capital murder. A Cameron County judge sentenced her to death. Nothing there proves that she physically did anything to commit the crime that she was convicted of. And, but there is plenty of evidence that shows she is innocent of the crime. Today, Huffman organized a rally trying to garner support to free Melissa Lucio. It was one of 14 rallies happening in the U.S. Lucio's lawyer submitted an application for clemency to Governor Greg Abbott and the Board of Pardons and Paroles in March. Abbott was asked about Lucio's execution at a border panel discussion in San Antonio Thursday. I still not received uh, a report from uh, the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles. Uh, that's a requirement for the governor to receive that before any action is taken. Uh, and when I receive that, I'll consider it. Uh, and, and take whatever action I think is appropriate. According to Texas Representative Joseph E. Moody, the Board of Pardons and Paroles is expected to make their recommendation Monday afternoon. understand that our efforts are important because we believe so much in her innocence. We know the death penalty action group is having a prayer vigil outside of the Texas State Capitol Monday. The group organizers say this will be an ongoing presence as they await action by the DA, courts, and Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles or the governor. Back to you. We'll be watching that one closely. Thank you, Lee. A fight between two neighbors on the northeast side ends in a shooting which sent one of them to the hospital, the other to be questioned by police. The shooting happened around 5 o'clock tonight on Moonlight Terrace near I-35 and Gibbsprawl Road. Witnesses telling police the two neighbors had an ongoing argument over a dog. Police say 58 year old man allegedly threatened to hit that dog with a shovel. That's when police say a 64 year old man allegedly got a gun and shot that other man once in the chest. Police say he could be facing a murder charge if the victim dies. 
A family of three grateful they escaped safely after a garage fire spread to their home as well as a neighbor's. The fire broke out around 3 a.m. at the home on West South Cross Boulevard near I-35 and Southwest Military Drive. The family told fire officials they stored mattresses in the garage, which caught fire. The garage was a total loss. Fire crews were able to put out the flames quickly, but the house and the home next door sustained some fire damage. The cause is still unknown. A man recovering tonight after being shot while riding his bike overnight. That shooting happened just before midnight on West Mitchell Street near I-10 in Probant. That man telling San Antonio police an SUV pulled up next to him and fired several shots before taking off. Police unsure right now if this was a targeted attack that man taken to the hospital. He was a talented music sound expert known in the San Antonio heavy medical heavy metal music scene for helping to make shows memorable. This week, his body was found in a tent next to a bridge in a rural part of northwest San Antonio. Tonight, his friends identify him as Todd Quaglia. They tell the night team's Patty Santos they'll miss him. Todd Quaglia, known for helping to bring loud heavy metal music to the masses in San Antonio, picked this quiet lot next to a bridge along Babcock Road to live out his last days. Everybody has a story and you never know who's sitting right beside you, what they could have done in life, what they, how they might have connected in your life. Friend Terry Anderson says part of Todd's story was over many decades working some big heavy metal music concerts in the Alamo City. He was like the extra member of every band because he would have three, four, five bands a night, but he'd be up there helping them with their sound, making sure that the monitors are good, making sure that the lights are good. Todd's knack for working these soundboards put him working in popular venues in the 90s, but friends say he fell on hard times. Once he became homeless, they're gone. He has no phone. There's just no way to find them anymore. Terry says a friend who would at times take him food was there Thursday when his body was found. Tonight, those who knew him want to make sure his life is remembered with meaning. I just wanted to make, make sure that he doesn't walk off stage without getting the applause he deserves. And tonight, the medical examiner tells us uh, the cause of death is still pending, but we do want to tell you friends set up a memorial in his honor in the area where his body was found. Tim, Courtney. Patty Santos, live in the newsroom for us tonight. Thank you. After a second day of searching, rescue crews come up empty handed in the search for a Texas National Guardsman who disappeared yesterday. That soldier assigned to Operation Lone Star in Eagle Pass, the Texas military department says he was trying to save two migrants who appeared to be drowning in the Rio Grande River. Officials say the soldier's family has been notified, but they are still waiting to release his name. They also say the search will continue for his body until they have exhausted all available resources. Texas has hundreds of millions of dollars ready and available to disperse to homeowners behind on rent this year after recent bills were passed in Congress. Today, city leaders hosted a homeowner and rental assistance fair to inform people about the funds and programs available to help. There are also funds to help specifically with property taxes, food stamps, and even television and internet services. For some, a bad situation during the pandemic has become even worse with recent inflation. Anything will do for me right now. I am I'm in between um, from my job and to disability right now. So um, it just anything will help right now. City leaders are planning to host another event just like this in the coming weeks. We'll be sure to keep you updated on when that date is announced. All right, half of the weekend is down and the second half is going to be very similar to the first half. And that means, yes, more wind coming up on your Sunday. Right now, as we look at downtown, it's a pleasant night, but that wind has just been a constant all day long. Temperatures only in the mid 70s. So thankfully, with that wind moving, it doesn't feel too sticky out there tonight. Our almanac for today at the airport, 70 the morning low, 10 degrees above average for this time of year and a high just shy of 90 degrees this afternoon. Thanks to some afternoon sun, the winds are still kicking our sustained wind speeds at this hour are still between about 15 and 25 miles per hour. So you can probably still uh, hear the wind outside your window tonight. Uh, things continue to stay windy tomorrow, but our reward for getting through another windy day is rain chances on Monday. Scattered showers and storms are in the forecast as we start the new work and school week. We'll talk about how much rain your yard could get and what the severe weather risk looks like coming up in the full forecast in just a little bit. 
More than 100,000 troops are fighting on Ukraine's grounds, trying to take over another city. The key reason behind Russia's push to gain control of Donbas. Plus, several western states dealing with evacuations in charred areas after multiple wildfires. The latest on the weather conditions that are not helping the situation. And it's an event that puts students' smarts to the test. We'll tell you what students gain from participating in the competitive solar race car event next. Well, after 12 weeks, it was time for Northside ISD students to put their skills to the track in this year's solar car races. More than 1,000 students participated. The students built miniature solar powered cars with gearboxes and axle rods, but all the designs and features they came, they came up with on their own. The event director says the project helps the kids learn the importance of STEM. This is a science engineering type challenge and how you have to be able to work on a team to be effective in that particular regard and how you problem solve is the most important lesson they get. Because you'll see them like today during the race day, they'll come in all kinds of different things that will go wrong or may not happen for them and they correct it during the day. So they're really able to execute in terms of solving problems real quickly. Always impressed by those little cars. This was the event's 25th year. Solar Cars is an after school science program for 4th through 6th grade students. Pretty neat. So is this the great air show at Joint Base San Antonio Randolph is back today was the first day of that event. Nearly 30,000 people were in attendance. The event celebrating a very important date today, which is the 75th anniversary of the United States Air Force. The event opened with diving airplanes and simulated bombings there at JBSA Randolph. Also a reenactment of the attack on Pearl Harbor. It was back for the very first time since 2017 and for some it was a trip down memory lane. My dad used to work for uh, Randolph. He used to work on the airplanes, so he was a mechanic. And we used to come as kids always to the air shows, and it's an experience to come back because we hadn't been to one in a long time. Now, for those who were not able to make it in today, they did have to close the gates because so many people were there. The good news is you can go again tomorrow, and the gates open at 9 a.m. to catch all of the action. A little windy out there. Though, yeah, today. you can see people's kind of shirts and sweaters blowing, blowing all around. All the interviews from that were... <laughs> the wind yeah. is blowing through there. You know, Worth it. I said a lot of people are like, we're sick of the wind yeah. and I get it, but at least it keeps it from feeling too sticky. True. You know, the wind keeps True. things mm -hmm. moving around just a bit. So that's nice. And we're going to have similar wind gusts tomorrow. So if your plans for Sunday take you out to the great Texas air show, here's what you can expect. 9 a.m. when those gates open, still cloudy, but it'll already start to be a little gusty. Gusts 30 miles per hour in the morning. And then as we get into the afternoon, peak gusts around 35 miles per hour. Some sunshine by about 1 p.m. And then more of a mix of sun and clouds tomorrow afternoon with a high in the upper 80s. So very similar weather to what we saw around the area today. Currently 73 Boulevard, 75 in Comfort, 78 there at Stinson and also 78 in Hondo. So still warm and yes, still windy. Our wind gusts are still close to 30 miles per hour in spots like Port SA and Stinson. So that wind is still kicking. A look ahead to your wind gust forecast for tomorrow. A little lower early in the day, but they'll quickly pick up again by about 9 a.m. Some gusts closer to about 30 miles per hour and then gusts peaking tomorrow afternoon and evening near 35 miles per hour. So the wind will be a factor once again on your Sunday. Otherwise, a lot like today, morning clouds, patchy drizzle and a few sprinkles will be possible early on in the day. Seeing some peaks of sun by lunchtime and then more of a mix of sun and clouds as we get into tomorrow afternoon with a high temperature in the upper 80s, low 90s and as we mentioned, windy again tomorrow. A very low end chance of a stray shower or storm sneaks into the forecast late tomorrow evening, but it's really going to be tomorrow night and especially Monday and Monday night that we see our rain chances peak. This is our best shot of rain in a while. So let me walk you through what we're expecting. Uh, this probably gets your attention. There is a big low pressure system spinning counterclockwise here. It is centered over the Dakotas, producing some winter weather there and also some severe weather on the east side of the system. Uh, parts of Oklahoma are under a tornado watch. That's that red box there, and there have been several tornado warnings across parts of the plains tonight. So what we've got here is a low pressure centered up well to the north and then a cold front draped all the way down across parts of the Texas Panhandle, even over to El Paso tonight. So what will happen tomorrow? This cold front is not going to move very much, so we see very similar weather through the day on Sunday. As we get into late Sunday evening, let's say this time tomorrow night, 
What I'll be watching for is any development, any thunderstorm development to our northwest up closer to the Concho Valley. That's places like Sonora and even farther north like San Angelo. I'll also be keeping an eye on anything that can pop up over the higher terrain of northern Mexico and see if that wants to wander our direction, uh, but especially north and west of San Antonio late tomorrow night. If anything can get going, it could try to move our way overnight and potentially bring us a morning round of shower and storms. But uh, what's an even better bet here for Monday is the cold front itself slowly moving through the area during the day, bringing us an even better chance of rain as we get into Monday afternoon, Monday evening, with even some lingering showers as we get into Monday night. So my highest confidence in rain Monday is going to be in the afternoon and evening, but we'll have to watch how storms behave late tomorrow night to see if maybe we even up the rain chances earlier in the day. As far as the severe weather risk on Monday, Monday. It's on the low end of things. Isolated severe storms would be possible. They'd be capable of producing some gusty winds and hail. But what this is really looking like for us here, since we'll have a prolonged period of scattered showers and storms, is some good rainfall through Tuesday. Areas along and west of 35 could see as much as an inch of rain, with some isolated totals a little bit higher than that. This will be a dent in a drought in the drought that we have needed for so long now. So Monday is the day, but again, keep in mind by tomorrow night, we could have some scattered storms starting to rumble on through lingering showers into Monday night, and then things wrap up by early on Tuesday. Check out that temperature on Tuesday. The front will actually help to put our highs in the 70s for a day, mm, guys. I like it's that. happening. It's really happening. Bring on that rain. All right, Larry, the San Antonio Sports Hall of Fame has some new members. Yeah, you know, what a great honor for these four individuals. If you make an impact in sports and you have ties to San Antonio, chances are you're going to be inducted into the San Antonio Sports Hall of Fame. Four new members inducted tonight. Plus, we have spring football games from Texas and out of Texas Tech coming up. For the second straight year, Sophia Young Malcolm enters the Hall of Fame. Last year was a Texas Sports Hall of Fame, and this year it's San Antonio's in Big Board Sports. The San Antonio Sports Hall of Fame added four new members tonight with a class of 2022 induction ceremony at the Henry B. Gonzalez Convention Center. Former WNBA San Antonio Superstar, All-Star and NCAA Champion Sophia Young Malcolm, 12-year NFL veteran Indy Kalu, Baylor University track All-American Natalie Nalepa, and iconic high school football coach, coach George Pastorchek are are all San Antonio Sports Hall of Famers. Marshall High School alum N.D. Kalu also starred for Rice before a long NFL career, and Nalepa attended Madison High School before going to Baylor University, where she set several records in cross country, indoor, and outdoor track. I think of all the phenomenal athletes, coaches that have come out of this city, and to be recognized amongst them is, it is it's truly an honor. It's a complete honor to be here tonight. I know my, my daughter, before we were getting ready, she said, Mommy, I'm so happy for you and so proud of you. You're going to do so great tonight. So for her being five years old, getting to experience this, it's like I cannot explain it. I'm so happy that my kids are uh, going to be able to see and they're old enough to remember this because this is San Antonio showing everyone how how great we do things here in the city. We wish he was here uh, and I so many of his players are going to be here tonight and I think that they are just so proud and I think for him to have this honor and to be remembered always I think that's really we're so proud. The Hall of Fame tribute celebrates those who have made an impact in the world of sports and have ties to San Antonio. More than 800 people were scheduled to attend. Led by second-year head coach Steve Sarkeesian, the Texas Longhorns closed out spring camp today with their annual orange-white game. Now, they did not keep score or play a normal game due to a lack of numbers on the offensive line. Instead, the plan was to run about 100 plays, capped off with the red zone competition at the end. Now, check out this pretty pass from quarterback Quinn Ewers. Play action, roll out, then throws deep and hits Isaiah Nayer in stride for a touchdown. Perfect toss and catch. Later on, the handoff goes to running back Roshan Johnson, and Dude does the rest, showing his power and speed on this 55-yard touchdown run. Coach Sark likes what he saw from his guys. This was about 
lining up, trying to play good football, who could block, who could get off blocks, who could tackle, who could cover, who could run routes and catch the ball in competitive settings. All in all, a good day. Um, plenty of stuff, I think, even when we look at this tape, for guys to work on. So um, yeah, we got work to do. Texas Tech fans got their first glimpse of the Red Raiders under new head coach Joey McGuire today in its annual spring game inside Jones AT&T Stadium. Second play of the game, quarterback Tyler Shuck gets intercepted by Rashad Williams, and he takes it back 38 yards for a touchdown, and Team Black, a.k.a. Team Matadors, leads it 7-0. 16 seconds left in the first half. Now first down and goal to go for Team Red. Shuck fakes a handoff that gets hit as he throws, and the ball's intercepted by linebacker Derek Luce, the second from Clemens High School. He gives Shuck a stiff arm during the return before he gets tackled around the 40-yard line. Sophomore making some noise. Now Black led 14-3 at halftime, and they win 24-6. So Team Matadors got prime rib for dinner for winning it, while the losing side, Team Red, well, they had to settle for hot dogs. The San Antonio Gunslingers kicking off a brand new season tonight at Freeman Coliseum against the Orlando Predators. San Antonio strikes first on the opening drive with this one-yard QB keeper. Extra point was blocked for a 6-0 lead, but Orlando scores 32 straight points in the half, and the Gunslingers can't quite rally to win their opener 44-36. to And we had a not-so-friendly ending at Yankee Stadium today. That's coming up later in sports. Ooh. Yeah, keeping it classy, Yankee fans. Hey! We'll have plenty to say about that in the next half hour. I'm saying nothing. I say nothing. We'll be right back. Wildfire dangers remain across several western states tonight where widespread red flag high wind warnings remain in effect. Yeah, those high winds coupled with dry conditions are fueling that destruction. Colorado's governor urging everyone to be vigilant. Here's ABC's Will Carr with the latest. Firefighters battling multiple fires across the southwest this weekend, including one near Colorado Springs, which forced 500 people to evacuate Friday. Those evacuations lifted, but forecasters are warning of strong winds, high temperatures, and bone-dry conditions heading into the summer. Oh, I think we should be concerned. Uh, you know, our drought conditions are, are such that it's, it's a high fire danger. They have gotten progressively bigger, progressively worse, progressively more in the, just in the last several years. Colorado's governor urged everyone to be vigilant. Be vigilant, uh, not just when you're camping in the backcountry, in your neighborhood, in your open space near your home. In northern Arizona, the tunnel fire has scorched more than 20,000 acres. This couple's home, a complete loss. I didn't want to believe it, but as we got closer, it was apparent that the whole house was gone. To see like everything burned is just very traumatic. <laughs> This church gathering donations to help those who've lost everything. We have been through this before. We've been through fires before. We've been through floods before. We've been through a lot of tragedies out here before. Sorry. And um, this is what we do. We're family out here. New Mexico's governor has declared a state of emergency across five counties, with more than 93% of the state under severe drought conditions. Some residents being told to prepare for possible evacuations. Will Carr, ABC News, Los Angeles. Now to the fallout from the January 6th insurrection. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene from Georgia, the first sitting Republican lawmaker to publicly testify. My question is just about whether anybody at all ever mentioned to you the possibility of violence. I don't remember. I, I have no idea. I don't think so. Green did publicly urge people to attend the rallies on January 6th and referred to the day as their, quote, 1776 moment, end quote. But she said she never encouraged violence and was focused on her plan to object to the certification of Joe Biden's win, the court compelling Green to testify. Her testimony was in response to a petition from voters who want to bar her from office. The group citing part of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution put in place after the Civil War that could disqualify qualify someone if they engaged in a rebellion. To the latest now on the war in Ukraine, President Zelensky holding a rare press conference in Kyiv on Saturday, answering questions and making a surprise announcement, saying he will meet with the U.S. Secretary of State and Defense Secretary in Kyiv on Sunday. The State Department and Defense Department declining to comment on that. Here's ABC's Christine Sloan with the details. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky holding a rare press conference underground on a subway platform in Kyiv. ABC's Marcus Moore asking him about the aid he has received so far from the United States. Are you pleased with the equipment that you are getting 
not only for the short term, but for the long term if this conflict drags on. We are very grateful to the, to the bipartisan support which we are receiving. Zelensky then saying he will meet in person with U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and Secretary of State Antony Blinken in Kiev on Sunday. The State and Defense Departments are declining to comment. If they do travel to Kiev, Austin and Blinken would be the highest ranking U.S. officials to meet with Zelensky in the war zone since Russia invaded Ukraine. Meanwhile, Russian President Vladimir Putin attended Easter Mass at a Russian Orthodox cathedral, seen crossing himself several times during the service, even as Russian forces continued their assault on Ukraine unleashing new attacks on the port city of Odessa. Ukraine claims Russia fired six cruise missiles. At least eight people killed, including a three-month-old baby, another 18 hurt in the attack. Russian forces also continued their attack on this besieged steel plant in Mariupol, which remains the last stronghold of Ukrainian resistance in the city. Mariupol's mayor claims on Facebook that Russian forces thwarted the latest attempt to help people leave the city. Christine Sloan, ABC News, New York. Around America now, talk about a terrifying close call. A truck driver in Ohio narrowly missing, hitting a school bus filled with children after the truck's brakes went out. It happened in Montville, Ohio, near Cleveland. The police department released this dash cam footage. The driver laid on the horn as the truck neared as a school bus stopped on the road to pick up children. Thankfully, they were able to weave between the bus and a pickup truck on the other side of the road. Here you can see it now. The truck continues about a quarter of a mile down the road before it is finally able to stop. More than 92 pounds of the synthetic opioids now in the hands of the California Narcotics Task Force after a major bust there. This happening at a raid of a fentanyl manufacturing lab in Oakland, California. The bust amounts to 42,000 grams of fentanyl that would have been headed to the streets of the Bay Area. The CDC believes fentanyl is now the primary cause of overdose deaths here in the U.S. On Twitter today, the Alameda County Sheriff's Department posted they have one suspect in custody and are continuing their hunt for at least one more. Earth Day events are still happening in the Alamo City. What made today's event at Woodlawn Park so unique? And it's a group of people that helped so many nonprofits run smoothly. Volunteers, how they were being celebrated today. Well, in case you didn't know, today is the last day for Volunteer Appreciation Week, and several nonprofits took the time to thank them for their service here locally. It was all part of the Day of the Volunteer. The event includes music, food, and games for volunteers and their families. It also served as a way for nonprofits to talk about their work for the community in order to encourage more volunteers to be a part of their work. And organizers say the nonprofits in attendance today depend on those volunteers. Growing up in San Antonio, I always saw that, uh, you know, people love to help each other out here in San Antonio. And so uh, when we're able to come back as a community and, and volunteer and serve each other, it just betters our community. So it's very important. In all, we're told about 40 nonprofits were at the first ever event. Organizers hoping to have even more there next year. Thank you, volunteers. Yes, thank you very much. You are appreciated. A lot of wind today, more wind tomorrow. But we've been talking about a chance of rain for the last few days. I promise it's coming on Monday, and I've got more on that in just a few minutes. I want to show you high temperatures across the country today. There was quite a big spread. We got to near 90 here in San Antonio, but look at all the blue there apart, um, across parts of Colorado, Wyoming, the Dakotas. It only got as warm as 37 in Casper, Wyoming today, and 40 in Bismarck, and that's because of this storm system, some severe weather happening across the plains tonight, and that cold front moves through our area on Monday. That spurs our chance of rain. We'll talk more about it, how much rain your yard could get coming up next. Dozens of people taking time out of their day to make a positive impact on our Earth in honor of Earth Day. Today, more than 50 environmentally focused organizations gathered at Woodlawn Lake Park for hands on activities, tree adoption and music acts. The goal of Earth Day is to get people across the globe to take meaningful actions to sustain our planet. 
I'm really proud to say this is our first uh, zero waste event. Well, we're striving for a zero waste event to protect our our park, our community. So um, we're trying to make sure everything that is given out here is recyclable or biodegradable. Some other ways they made the event zero waste, getting rid of single-use plastic, avoiding, avoiding flyers, and encouraging people to bring their own drinking containers and utensils. Imagine there was a law there and it just smashes it right down the middle, just backs it. I don't know. <laughs> Are we listening to sports? There's a conversation going on somewhere in our heads. <laughs> Go ahead, take it away, Kate. I'm going to listen to the voices in my head. <laughs> They're in my head, too, so I feel like, I don't know, we've been together too long. I, I heard it, too, you guys. I, I heard it, too. All right. Um, so this is the time of year where oak is an issue. Our counts typically peak in early to mid-April, so we're past the peak, but we still had some really high numbers in the past week or so. Today's oak count is not too bad. It's right around 950, but I think the reason why we've seen some really high counts lingering uh, over the past couple of weeks is because we haven't had any rain to wash any of that oak pollen away. And just for some perspective, um, and that should be not March 2022, that should be April. We've only gotten um, about three tenths of an inch of rain at the airport in San Antonio, but since the start Start of the year, January 1st, about two and a half inches of rain, but that's five inches below average um, compared to where we should be through this point in the year. And the lack of rainfall, not only this calendar year, 2022, but also the very dry uh, late fall and winter that we had last year has resulted in this, our current drought situation. Everywhere you see that dark red color or the bright red, that's either extreme or exceptional drought. drought. And that's essentially everyone along and west of 35 and west of 37 uh, south of Highway 90 and San Antonio. So we need rain in a big way. We've been talking about that for seems like a few months now. And finally, we've got our first shot at putting a little dent in this drought coming up on Monday. Rain chances will be highest Monday. They'll linger through early on Tuesday. So here's the rainfall potential through Tuesday. The highest totals, most rain, will be along and west of 35. Again, that's where we need it. That's pretty good. Um, but even folks south and east of San Antonio that are expecting lower totals could still see between a half inch to about three quarters of an inch of rain. But totals getting closer to an inch and some isolated totals of more than an inch of rain will be for areas west of the I-35 corridor. Again, that will be through Tuesday. That's when rain chances start to taper off early in the day on Tuesday. Um, as we go through Sunday, Aside from a stray evening shower or storm, rain chances don't really start to pick up until Sunday night, late Sunday night, and then into Monday and Monday night. So let's talk about this setup once again. We've got a cold front way off to our northwest that has been producing some severe storms across parts of the plains, mainly Oklahoma this evening. That front tomorrow will still be way off to our north and to our west. It really won't make much progress during the day on Sunday. So that's why our weather won't be changing much tomorrow. Morning clouds, some afternoon clearing and windy. Now by about this time tomorrow night, I'll be watching for any thunderstorm development north and west of San Antonio. There are indications that some strong storms along that front way up near San Angelo could try to wander our way overnight tomorrow night into the pre dawn hours of Monday morning. So we'll continue to monitor that potential closely. That would lead to higher chances of rain on Monday morning. However, even if that pans out, we're still expecting a scattering of rain into the afternoon and evening as the frontal boundary itself moves through. So here's the deal with Monday. It's not going to be just one quick hitting period with rain and then that's it. We could see the, the scattered rain and storms linger into the evening hours, even into the nighttime hours on Monday before that front finally drops south and takes the rain with it early on Tuesday. So plan on rain affecting your plans on Monday. We'll go ahead and say from the morning all the way through the evening and uh, we'll have the very latest for you coming up tomorrow and keep that case out weather app close. Current temperatures are in the low to mid 70s in most spots. Temperatures won't drop drastically overnight, so we'll start you off in the morning near 70 degrees, warming up into the upper 80s and low 90s after morning clouds give way to some afternoon sunshine on your Sunday. So again, rain chances start to pick up scattered tomorrow night 
and also through a good portion of the day on Monday. Again, we think the scattered rain is going to kind of come and go on Monday, wrapping up early on Tuesday. That front will put our highs in the 70s by Tuesday afternoon. That'll be pretty nice, guys. Weather in the 70s, the oak being washed away. What more could you ask for? Don't ask for too much. Okay, <laughs> that's it. That's all I want. Stop right there. Okay. All right, Larry, uh, the Mavs get one of their key players back as they continue their playoff run against uh, the Jazz. Yeah, Luka Doncic was out because he was dealing with a calf issue, but he returned today for game four of that series against the Utah Jazz. And in soccer, San Antonio FC is still undefeated on the road this season. Coming up. Luka Doncic returned to the Dallas Mavericks lineup tonight after missing the first three games of their playoff series with the Utah Jazz because of a strained calf. And Luka showed no rust, scoring a game high of 30 points in 34 minutes. Less than 15 seconds left in the fourth now. Jazz ball. Donovan Mitchell plays out of the oop with Rudy Gobert and the Jazz lead it 100 to 99. The Mavs' Spencer Dinwiddie missed a three at the buzzer, and the Utah Jazz win at home 100 to 99 to tie the series at two games all. We, we got a crucial game, and it's a new series, and we got to go back to Dallas and, and get a win. You know, I, I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, yeah, like, we you know, this is, we, get, we did it once. We got to do it again. Game five is Monday night in Dallas. And two more finals from today. The Raptors beat the Sixers 110-102 to 102 to avoid a four-game sweep. And the Celtics defeated the Nets 109-103, to 103, and they lead that three games to none. All right, in soccer, San Antonio FC back in action tonight, playing at New Mexico United in USL Championship play. No score until the 67th minute after drawing a penalty in the box. Justin Dillon puts it past the keeper for a 1-0 lead. His first goal of the season ends up being the game winner, and San Antonio wins it 1-0. Good matchup this afternoon at Northside Softball Field. Holmes taking on Stevens. Huskies up 7-2 in the bottom of the third and pouring it on. Caitlin Casas finds the gap down the right field line. Cindy Rios scores from second. And it's 8-2 Holmes. A few batters later, Nevea Herrera drives in Casas with this RBI single to left field. Huskies cruise to an 11-6 win, and they finish 12-4 in District 29-6A play. How about some baseball at Antonio and Apache's host in San Antonio Christian this afternoon. Game tied at one, top of the six, runners on the corners. Bodie Allen puts it in play. Second baseman knocks it down, but the Apaches can't turn the double play as Austin Klinkscale scores the go-ahead run. San Antonio Christian leads 2-1. to one. They're still up. One on the bottom of the seventh. Antonian has the tying run on third, and this one's hit well to center field, but Adam Reyes makes a tough grab to end the game. Lions win it 2-1 to one and improve to 5-1 and one in district play. Now a member of the Toronto Blue Jays, George Springer faces former club Houston Astros for the first time today, and dude went yard on the fifth pitch of the ball game. He said it was emotional, weird, and cool at the same time. Top of the seventh now tied at two, and Santiago Espinal hits a big fly to left field for the final run of the game. Blue Jays win 3-2 to two for Houston's fourth straight loss. The Rangers at the A's today, top of the eighth, no score when Brad Miller hits a single to left field. One run scores, but pinch runner Eli Wyatt was thrown out at the plate by a strong throw from left fielder Tony Kemp. The Rangers lost an earlier challenge, so they couldn't appeal. But the umpires initiated a crew chief review and overturned the initial call, saying Oakland's catcher illegally blocked the plate. So that's a two-run single, and the Rangers take it two to nothing. Guardians at the Yankees, and it had a trashy ending. Bottom of the ninth, Glaber Torres comes up with a walk-off RBI single to help the Yankees win 6-5. Within seconds now, some fans in the right field bleachers at Yankee Stadium pelted Cleveland outfielders with bottles, cans, and debris. Aaron Judge and other Yankees tried to calm the fans down, tell them to stop. Now, earlier in the inning, Cleveland outfielder Stephen Kwan hit the left field wall hard while chasing a ball. Kwan was shaken up and he had some cuts on his face, and there was a specific Yankee fan in left field celebrating the fact Kwan got hurt. So Guardian center fielder Miles Straw climbed the chain league fence and left to confront the fans and stick up for his teammate. Guys? So many things. That was like a Spider-Man move, first of all. And then... No, that was a trash move. The okay. Yankees fans trash. throwing trash on the field at my Guardians. Not I cool. don't condone the activity, <laughs> but I'm glad we won. All right, we'll continue the debate right after this. <laughs>